What this tremendous blast did to the atoll, nobody knows. Re-entry parties are leaving the Rendova now by helicopter. The Navy Task Group, commanded by Rear Admiral Wilkins, has the problem of providing the means to re-enter shortly after the blast to get exposed film, samples, and other scientific data. Since no land mass is available, the problem is complicated. Re-entry must be from a ship. Further, fallout will be very high starting at about M plus one hour. Helicopters must get in quickly and get out again before that hour is up. One survey group is leaving here from the estuary. I can't go along, but you can, and see for yourselves, through the eyes of the camera, what has happened back on the Azor. of titanic energy released by stars. But even the largest man-made explosion in the history of the world has little meaning unless we compare it to everyday items we understand. So at this point, let's replay the detonation. Go back and watch Mike in action once again. Remember those final last seconds? Five, four, three, two, This is the largest fireball ever produced. At its maximum, it measures about three and one quarter miles in diameter. Compared to the skyline of New York, this means that with the Empire State Building as zero point, the Mike Fireball would extend downtown to Washington Square and uptown to Central Park. In other words, the fireball alone would engulf about one quarter of the island of Manhattan. The tremendous upsurge of air from the detonation rapidly pushes up the mic cloud. Again, nothing of this height and width has ever before been witnessed. If the picture is stopped at this point in the cloud's growth, the height of the cloud is approximately 40,000 feet. This means that 32 Empire State buildings at 1,250 feet per building could be piled one on top the other before they would attain the cloud's height at this time, roughly two minutes after zero. Some 10 minutes later, the cloud approaches its maximum. At this time, the mushroom portion of the cloud has pushed up to around 10 miles and spreads out along the base of the stratosphere to a width of about 100 miles, while the stem itself is pushed upward deep into the stratosphere to a height of about 25 miles. The results of this tremendous power can be shown at the atoll. Here is an aerial photo of the test area of the atoll before the blast. And here is the same area after the blast, showing the crater caused by Mike. The outlined island in the center is former Ilugilab, the Zero Island. Sections of the islands on either side have been chopped off. The crater is roughly a mile in diameter. When it is illustrated that some 14 Pentagon buildings could be comfortably accommodated in this hole, the size of the Mike crater becomes more real. In profile, the crater gradually slopes down to a maximum depth of some 175 feet, or equivalent to the height of a 17-story building. The lateral destructive effects are the greatest yet observed from a single explosive device. Without getting into the areas of target evaluation or secondary effects, it can be safely assumed that there was complete annihilation within a radius of three miles, or out to and including all of Enjabi that there was severe to moderate damage out to seven miles or down to Rujoro, and that light damage extended as far as 10 miles or down to Runnet. 
Relating this area of damage to a city like Washington, D.C., would present a picture something like this. With the capital as zero point, there would be complete annihilation west to Arlington Cemetery, east to the Anacostia River, north to the soldiers' home, and south to Bowling Field. Complete annihilation, and that is mentioning merely the primary damage. What you have just seen was an awesome turning point in history, a development affecting not only the future of humanity, but the security of our nation, the safety of our communities, and the well-being of our homes and our families. President Eisenhower was speaking, not alone to the United Nations, but to every American when he said, and I quote, let no one think that the expenditure of vast sums for weapons and systems of defense can guarantee the absolute safety for the cities and citizens of any nation. The awful arithmetic of the atomic bomb does not permit of any such easy solution. Even against the most powerful defense, an aggressor in possession of the effective minimum number of bombs for a surprise attack could probably place a sufficient number of his bombs on the chosen targets to cause hideous damage. End of the quote. Consequently, our national civil defense effort must concern itself with three major factors. One, intensified civil defense preparations to reduce the loss of life, property, and production. Two, greater personal preparations for your recovery and for that of your family. Three, our moral determination to fight back and to win if war should come even in spite of our efforts for peace. In light of the picture which you have just seen, I ask you to ponder these concerns in your heart and in your conscience as a responsible American citizen. Two courses of action must be followed on the long and difficult road to peace. First, unceasing efforts to reach international agreement upon such a sound proposal as President Eisenhower made to the United Nations for the constructive use of atomic energy in the service of all mankind. This requires better and deeper understanding of the problems it faces upon the part of the American public. Second, prudence dictates steadfast preparation by us at home to back up our president as he goes into the councils of the world in order that he may lead from strength, strength based upon an assurance that the American people are prepared to withstand any assault. This is no simple thing to do. It requires personal dedication and diligence in civil defense as a safeguard until that day when a just and lasting peace may come to the world. This we can do. This we must and we will do as America, determined to protect and advance America and free people everywhere.